for a little while here, I've been trying to walk us through a series of messages that I would just put underneath this title, um, developing our faith to live from our God-given identity. The more I have walked with God and tried to get in touch with who God says that I am, the more I've realized it takes a lot of faith to do it. You're not going to live out who God says you are apart from believing some things. Our goal is to believe what God believes. He's already believing something about us. Isn't that wonderful? A lot of us don't know that yet. God's already believing something about me. I need to catch up with him. The moment I step into uh, receiving revelation from him, where he, he tells me who I am, just like Jesus told Peter or Simon, you're no longer Simon. I now call you Peter. And, uh, and then begins to tell Peter about his, his future and what he's going to do with the keys of the kingdom and so forth. Uh, Peter was not prepared at that moment to embrace what Jesus was saying to him. There were a few things that still had to be taken care of in his life. And even after the day of Pentecost, there was more things that Peter had to process out in order to f walk fully in who God said he was. So this is an unfolding process, but it takes faith to believe what God says about us. This is not a pride issue. It's not an arrogance thing. It's just a, a point of, of agreement. You're actually in your greatest level of humility when you're just believing what God believes about you. And uh, none of us would say that God is arrogant or prideful for believing that he's God and acting like it. What happens to you and I when we believe who God says we are from his authority and then we act like it? Some great things could happen. In fact, Satan is warring against you ever understanding the truth about you from heaven's perspective that you'll never fully understand. Um, as I mentioned a few weeks ago about these, these books that exist in heaven that have our names on them where things have already been pre-written. You can see that in Psalm 139. Satan does not want you and I to ever embrace those things, to ever know about them. Because if the moment you, you begin to understand that God has already been, written some things down, he's already believing some things, he's already prepared works that you will walk in and accomplish through Jesus, uh, he knows that if you if you get a download on that stuff, you might be tempted to actually step out and start doing it. And that's his worst nightmare. Because with your identity also comes your authority, your authority to be who God says you are. And if you go back to Genesis one, two and three, you'll see that God had a master plan that involved the creation of you and I where he, you know, the Godhead got together and said, let us make man, uh, Adam, mankind, uh, this new race of, 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 of created being who will be in our image. And then he said, and then let them rule over all the things that are in the earth. And we don't have time to unpack that, but God's plan was always that we would rule with him which takes authority, but you're not going to operate in your authority to do what God has called you to do here in the earth. And by the way, you're going to continue to rule and reign with him throughout eternity. You're not just going to get assigned your harp and sit on a cloud and be in an eternal drug state of, of bliss or something, you know, um, you're, we are, we have an assignment that goes from here all the way through, through eternity with no end. So we, we will rule and reign with him. This lifetime is, is a dress rehearsal for a lot of those things. And we're actually accumulating reward, restoring of treasure in heaven as we walk in the things that God has already assigned to us, if we will believe it. So Satan's goal is to, to lie to you, to convince you, to believe something about you that's not true, so you'll live according to that. 
because as I've said over and over again, we live from who we think we are. You, you never rise above to live out um, beyond what you actually believe about yourself. You can quote all kinds of scriptures. You can be in Joel Osteen's church and say, <laughs> make the declaration of I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says. <laughs> you, know, you can say that over and over again, but until you actually believe and then start living according to that, uh, nothing's happening. So, um, so this takes faith. We've, we've got to believe. I don't want to get bogged down in a, in a long introduction here. You'll have to go back and l listen to some previous messages. But I, want to, I just want to continue to talk about the faith to live from this identity and the things that we need to embrace. Because God is, once God calls you to himself, he now has to start developing in you that identity. It has to grow in you as you welcome it and believe it and take steps with it. And uh, sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back. But nonetheless, God is working with us. Aren't you glad he's patient? I, I remember many, many years ago, I think I was 15 when I heard this, first heard the statement, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. And I found that I, I, I need I'm the one who needs to be the most patient with me, but fortunately God is, God is patient. He is, he, he who began a good work in me has plans to finish it. And he's working around my life. If I would just cooperate and the best way you can cooperate is through surrender and belief. I believe you, God, I'm surrendering to your plan. I'm going to, I'm going to let you move in my life. Your plans are better than my plans. I want you to go to uh, Jeremiah chapter one. I'll make a couple of statements here while you're turning there. Um, here, here's just some questions that, that I keep asking myself as a regular um, exercise to keep me sharp in this area. Every day I'm realizing I'm in a battle over my identity. And so I have to ask myself, do I know who God says I am? Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to become something that I'm not. And the whole world is performing for everybody else in the world to try to be something because they actually don't believe that they are. But uh, do, I be, do I know who God says I am? Do I believe it? Because I've, I've had revelations about who God says that I am. I've had, I've had various ways that God has come to me. Uh, th either th uh, through the word or through through uh, the church or, th or through uh, prophetic uh, words given and so forth. But I've had God come to me in many ways to say this. This is how I see you. This is who you are. Um, this is what you're called to. But then I have to keep asking myself, do I believe it? I'll show you what you believe by what you do with what you say you believe. Another question is, do I know my value? Do I know my worth? Not according to what the world would try to, to put on me or take away from me, but do I know my value as stated from God imparted to me? God is the only one who can impart value to you because he's the one who created you. No one else has the authority to put any value on you. So do I know my true value and my worth? And, uh, and do I believe that? That one right there will test you like crazy because we're so accustomed to getting our value from other people. What other people think about us. We're massively programmed in this world toward what other people think about us and the value they place on us, whether they approve of us or not, or accept us or not. Um, beyond what you can even imagine, we have been so programmed. The whole world operates this way. You, you can't, you can't operate it in, uh, in the world without playing their program of uh, uh, ascending the ladder of, of worth according to what they, they say about you. And that's where we get a lot of our fears, by the way, because we fear the power of other people to devalue us according to their judgments and what they think about us. So 
do I believe the value that God has placed on me? Because you'll never move out and operate beyond what you, what you think your value is. You'll always get intimidated. There's always somebody who'll be able to shout you down. There's always somebody who will say, no, you can't do that. No, you're disqualified. And uh, there's so many times when the enemy would be coming after me and I'm, I'm getting attacked and, and I can feel all the negative emotions and the fears and all the rest coming at me. And then I'll, I'll just say, Lord, what is going on here? And he said, well, the enemy's just trying to get you to disqualify yourself. And he said, and as soon as you choose to disqualify yourself by taking yourself down in your own value. And I'm, I'm not allowed to do this. I'm not qualified to do this. As soon as you agree with that, uh, you can't operate above that. Okay. I'll let some of you are going to have to go back and listen to this. So I live from who I think I am. The orphan, the orphan heart, which is really the heart of the, of the world, separated from God. The orphan heart spends their whole life trying to prove their value in order to gain an identity from other people's approval. I never realized that that's what I was doing. I was doing that as a pastor, trying to plant churches and, and lead congregations that I was so much of what I was doing, I was doing in order to gain the approval of other people so I could gain an identity. And the identity with that I was going after was super pastor, which makes me super successful. And you might like me more, might love me more, might esteem me more. You might even be willing to follow me. So I was working really hard trying to get my identity from. And uh, what I realized that God actually pulled me out of ministry for three years to rearrange my heart. Because he, he just said, Paul, you're. I know you, you're trained to be a pastor, but you don't even know how to be my son. You don't know who you are in my eyes. You don't know how to just get everything that you need from what I think about you. So you're busy performing and controlling a lot of things and, and you're just an orphan leader leading an orphanage. True confessions. A son, on the other hand, knows their value How do they know their value? Because they have a father that's telling them why, how, what, <laughs> everything about them, giving identity. A son knows their value and believes their identity given by the father, and they act in accordance with that, regardless of what other people think. Now, that is Jesus right there. Jesus was able to operate in this world completely rejected by the entire systems of the, of the world. And he was unmoved by what anybody thought. He could do whatever he needed to do, say whatever he needed to say, um, and lead the beginning of, of a movement without building an institution. I mean, he just, he was completely free from the fear of man. Nobody had a handle on him. The devil tried it in the wilderness, couldn't get a handle on Jesus. It was the first person that Satan wasn't successful with getting a handle on him and to manipulate them through fear and, uh, and, and get them to surrender their authority. The religious leaders couldn't manipulate Jesus. Even Pilate, as Jesus stood before Pilate and said, don't you know that I have power to crucify you? And Jesus said, Nope. I'm here because my father chose for me to be here. I'm here by my own accord. I could call 10,000 angels and you'd be vaporized. But you see, my kingdom is not of this world. 
you have no authority over me except that my father gave it to you. So I'm happily content standing before you. I know who I am. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. You, on the other hand, don't have a clue about you. But if you're going to crucify me, you're just a puppet. You're just being manipulated through your own fears, your own orphan heart by these religious leaders who are threatening you. And that's why you're going to crucify me. But that's okay. Because I'm just going to rise in three days anyway. And then you'll all see who I really am. So Jesus lived in such utter freedom in the Father's love. He, he knew who he was. He knew where he came from. In fact, the Gospel of John tells us that as Jesus, before he took up the towel to wash the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, it says, Jesus knowing that he had completed everything that the father had asked him to do, knowing that he had loved them to the uttermost, knowing that he had been sent from the father, knowing that he was going back to the father. It says Jesus knew who he was. He knew everything that was going on around him. He knew what his assignment was. He knew he had completed all of it. He had his absolute security of his own soul. And knowing all about himself, and who he, who he was as Lord and Master, he picks up a towel and washes their feet. I tell you, you've got to have your identity to take the role of the lowest position available in washing people's feet as a servant in the house. That's why Peter reacted so strongly. No, Lord, no, I can't. I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And and because. Uh, because what Jesus was doing was violating the orphan system. Okay, I'm going on a rabbit trail here. This mess. This message is five hours, five hundred hours long. Um, <laughs> it deserves uh, several volumes of a book. Your authority to live in your identity rests on whether you've been born again. When you have been born again by the Spirit of God, you are now brought into right relationship with God, and you have restored back to you the power to live it, to live what you were actually created for. People who are separated from God, they, they have not received uh, a new nature. They, they have no access to their true identity. They may have some of the gifts that God has given to them, and they may live powerfully in the earth according to those gifts, but they never touch their identity, and they never actually produce what God raised them up for. You have to be born again. You have to be reconnected to your heavenly father by the spirit to receive that new nature, which is supernatural, so that you can begin to live according to who God says you are from heaven toward earth. Until you're born again, the world is happening to you. When you are born again and receive that new nature, you become a son and a daughter. Now you can begin to happen to the world. That was a while. I'm still trying to I'm still trying to wrap my head around it so I can live according to that. I, I, I try to get up as often as I can in the morning and saying, world, I'm about to happen to you. And orient my thinking within my identity from God it has nothing to do with being a pastor. It just has to do with the fact that I've been born again. I've received the spirit of God without measure. I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. I've been given power and authority. I've embraced up with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. That's a pretty good package to get up <laughs> with each day. And I have all the promises of God. And I got this great cloud of witnesses that are saying, you can do it.
And Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of my faith, who's already run the race and he's standing at, at the end of the runway and saying, come on, Paul. Run with endurance. The race that has already been set before you see it. You're, you're either going to run a race that somebody else has set before you because you're letting them define who you are and what you're worth and that, or you're going to run the race that Jesus has already set before you. So again, and it, that begins when you start getting your identity. I belong to God. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. He loves me. He wants me. He knows me. He's chosen me. He's already set all these things in place. I, it's an interesting study when you in the in the Greek and the New Testament that the words related to destiny and and all, all of these kinds of things are all, all the root meaning behind it is something that has been already set in place by God before the foundation of the world. So you and I are just coming into the knowledge of the things that have already been set in place by God and everything that he has set in place regarding you, his faith is all over it. Part of the reason that Jesus came in the flesh as a man was to prove to us we can do it. Because he didn't do it as deity. He did it as as a second Adam. He came to do what the first Adam didn't do. He, first Adam dropped the ball. He handed off his, his authority to the devil. The second Adam shows up and he takes it back. And he shows us how to do it. He shows us how to live it. And that whoever believes in him, he then gives his spirit to you. He takes you and places you into Christ so that all the realities about who Jesus is and what he did and his relationship with the Father now become true to you. That's all for us. We get to live in it. If any man be in Christ, that's, a, that is a, that's another whole volume right there. And so Satan has done everything he can to try and blind us to knowing who we are so that we'll never know what we can do. Now, the orphan heart is, has this idea that if I just do enough of these things, then I can become. But when you come into the kingdom and you're just made a son and daughter based on what somebody else did, it reverses the order. I get to do these things because I already am. He's already brought me in. He's already placed on me the spirit of adoption. He's already brought me fully before the Father. I'm already loved. I'll never be loved any more than I am right now. My potential is beyond my imagination with God. And so this is, this is why Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you receive the whole package right up front. Now you got to work it out. But in the world system, you ain't nothing until you perform your way all the way to a place where you deserve something and you're qualified for something in the eyes of somebody else. In the world, you can never qualify yourself. You always have to wait for somebody else to put a stamp on you. Somebody else gets to tell you whether you deserve it or not. And your eyes are focused on that measuring stick constantly. You notice they keep changing the measuring stick. They keep moving the goalposts. But you come to, you come to, to the back to the Father through Jesus, and he just gives you the whole enchilada. <laughs> God's into Mexican food, of course. <laughs> In my case, it would have been the chili relleno, but uh, <laughs> but he get he 
He give this is this is the nature of grace. God makes you to be something that you are not yet because of what he's already believing. But now we, through our fear and trembling and having received this amazing deposit of what God is saying over us, that with fear and trembling, we, we say, okay, I'm going to, now I'm going to work this out, but I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to perform anything. I'm not earning anything because I already am. That's why the Pharisees had such a hard time with Jesus. One of the reasons, because he kept saying, well, I, I am. And they're saying, no, you can't be because you haven't done everything that we've done. You haven't, you haven't gone through our rabbinical schools. You haven't, uh, you're not keeping all of the, the rules and the traditions and all the rest. So you, you haven't arrived yet. You're not qualified to be the Messiah. And Jesus said, I arrived as the Messiah. <laughs> and the whole world out there is waiting for you and I to arrive. If we would believe who God says we are, if we would believe the package that we've already received in the Holy Spirit. But as long as you and I are struggling to, to grapple and accept what God has said about us, we will continue to disqualify ourselves and be easily intimidated and pushed off from what we've been called to do. Okay, I, I got to make this message legal with scripture. So you're in Jeremiah 1, right? Okay, I, I can tell I'm, I'm only going to get partway through this. But anyway, this will be good. Jeremiah whose name means appointed of God. That's what a name. Every time you meet Jeremiah, it's usually say, oh, you're appointed of God. In a real sense, every one of us is a Jeremiah. What an identity to carry around. What if you and I really believe that? I'm appointed of God. I mean, you literally, every... You, you, you even believe that subconsciously. You don't even have to work at it. I, I am of God. I'm appointed of God. I've, I've been destined to be here. I carry something heavenly over my life. Hmm. So Jeremiah shows up at a time in Israel's history where Israel is not behaving very well. They've offended God. More times than you can count, God's patience has now run very thin, and God is is sending them some very strong warning through Jeremiah. He's got a really tough assignment because the people that God's going to send him to don't want to hear a single word he has to say. And they, they easily throw around the words false prophet. Part of it is because all their other prophets were all saying the opposite of what Jeremiah said. So Jeremiah has been called by God to do something really, really hard. But God would never do that with you, of course. Sometimes I, I wish when we were born again, he just beamed us out of here. But he left us here because we have an assignment. There's an appointment. God's waiting for you and I to happen in the world. So verse four, Jeremiah, he exposes something. It, it, it's, I just call it one of these windows into heaven where you, you get to see something and um, understand the ways of God. And, uh, and if you understand the ways of God, you might better understand what he's doing with you and, uh, and how he's going to work through you. So Jeremiah says, now the word of the Lord came to me. Now he's talking about his first encounter with God. You, you got to understand, previous to this word, Jeremiah was not a prophet. He was just a bullfrog. I don't know where that came from. 
I, I really believe I have one of these angels that's from the humor department from, from heaven. And once in a while it shows up and whispers something in my ear. God's really into humor anyway, but I... Uh, But you, you gotta you gotta grasp this that I don't know that Jeremiah grew up as a child, as a boy, with his mom saying, Someday you're gonna be a prophet. He's just a young man growing up grappling with what's going on in in uh in Israel and and um he has some kind of relationship with God. So he's just been in process. How many, how many believe God was processing Jeremiah for the moment that the word would come? The revelation is going to come to Jeremiah at the right time for the right moment, for the, for the right everything to fall into place. And you need to understand that God has been preparing you in ways that you can't even imagine for the things he's called you to do. You may not have any clue about the bigger picture but he has been faithful to be working in your life, even through the worst things that have happened to you. He's been preparing you and getting you ready for the moment that a greater revelation is going to come to you. So that at the moment that the revelation comes, you can say, oh, well, that makes sense because of all these other things that have been happening. Um, but God's been God's been preparing you. He's also been preparing the people that he's sending you to. The places where you're going to happen. He's been preparing all of that as well. And uh, so we're, we're just not being thrown out there on our own trying to make something happen. But this thing has really been very well orchestrated. And uh, so we don't know anything about Jeremiah's life up to this point. But here's the word that comes to Jeremiah. And the, and I, I don't want you to, to hear these words from the standpoint of this is just about Jeremiah. This, this is a revelation, actually, of the ways of God with all of us. We all have different assignments, different things that we've been appointed to. Um, and I love what uh, I heard the prophet Bob Jones say years ago. He said, the pay is the same, no matter what your assignment is. The pace is saying, the question is, are you faithful with what God has appointed you to? And if you look around and compare yourself to other people, you're already in trouble. In fact, the reason you're doing that is because you're already so processed for getting your value from what other people think. But the best thing that can happen for us is that we believe what God has given, what he says about us and what he's given us to do. And 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 say, you know what, this is the best lane I could stay in for the rest of my life. If I do this really well, I will finish well. I don't need to be in somebody else's lane. You're never happy when you're in somebody else's lane anyway. Yeah, okay. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Oh, okay. That you could spend an hour or more just meditating on that right there. God's saying, Jeremiah, you're not an accident. I actually formed you. So a lot of our identi identity begins with us realizing God is responsible for me. He made me. He made me with a plan. And before he formed me, he already was knowing me. And we've touched on that a lot. Paul addresses that in Ephesians um, and in Romans, called before the foundation of the world. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You weren't just an idea. God, God has actively been knowing us, and only he can do this. It's hard to wrap your, your mind around this. God knowing me before I existed. So somehow in, in his ability with his foreknowledge, his, his, his supernatural capacities as God, he is actually able to know us before we've ever lived our lives. 
He already knows what you're going to say later today. He's already knowing it. That's a long relationship. And guess what? He didn't give up. <laughs> when he saw beforehand what was coming, he didn't say, oh, I've changed my mind. Cancel that birth right there. I, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That word consecration in the Hebrew just means I took you and I set you apart onto a specific assignment that nobody else can do except you. In relationship to revealing his glory. Every one of us carries an aspect of God that nobody else has. And so if you don't happen, the world will not see that part of God. So I consecrated you. I set you apart. I appointed you before you were born. I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, Jeremiah, not, he heard the first part, but he might not have been ready for the next part. I've appointed you to be a prophet. To, and at that point, Jeremiah said, ah, no, thank you. <laughs> I know what happens to all your prophets. <laughs> I was excited up until this point. <laughs> I've appointed you to be a prophet, not just to your nation, but to the nations. You're going to have a, a, a broader impact. It doesn't matter what the impact is. It doesn't matter what your, your sphere that God has called you to. It's just exciting to know that God has had his hand on your life and he has been speaking things over you and appointing you to things in advance. But in this case with Jeremiah, he said, I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord God. <laughs> Can we back up, oh God? <laughs> you know, I really, think, I really think, though, that when God gives us a revelation, starts talking to us about who we are, we should, we should have that same kind of response. Alas. <laughs> what can I say? This is this this is beyond me. This is this overwhelms me. Alas, Lord God. In part of the reason why we uh, we arrive at that alas is because when God comes and He begins to speak over us, we immediately start to judge the things that He's saying about us according to our previous judgments about ourselves that we carry, that we don't even know are there. We've already placed certain values on ourselves that we have believed and received from the world, maybe from your own parents. or some teacher who said, you're dumb as an ox and you don't even <laughs> think about going to college or, <laughs> or whatever, you know. I, We've had so many people put certain value judgments and statements over us, and we've bought into a whole bunch of things. So then, so God comes with his word, and it runs right into what's already programmed inside of us. And there's a moment where we just say, oh, how can this be? Lord, this, this, is, uh, this is hard for me to receive. Alas, Lord God. And then Jeremiah immediately launches into... Behold, um, I don't know how to speak because I'm just a youth. So where's Jeremiah going? He's going into his list of disqualifications. So settle it in your heart right now. You already have a list of disqualifications inside of you. You may not have ever consciously thought them out, but they come up every single day. Well, Lord, I, I'm just this. Lord, I, you know, and, and then we pull out our list with God. Moses did that too at the burning bush. <laughs> Lord, I, this, is, this is a bad idea because I don't you know I can't speak. I love God's response. Well, who made your mouth?
I just need access to your mouth. I don't need your skills. I just need for you to show up. Jeremy, I need for you to show up. Your appointment starts right now. I've got something I need to get done and, and you're, you're my man. Lord, I don't know how to speak because I'm a youth. Well, in Jeremiah's mind, that was a big issue. He probably, we, we don't really know how young Jeremiah was, but he could, he could have been 20 years old. And he's going to go and start prophesying to kings and elders and others. And, and then in the natural, they would look at him and just say, who do you think you are? You whippersnapper. <laughs> How arrogant of you to show up here and think that you have something to say. Don't you know who you are? And that'll be the question. Do I know who I am? Do I know who sent me? That'll determine whether you follow through on what God's called you to do and whether you do it with any authority. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth. Because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So God, come, God always has a good comeback, by the way, for every one of our excuses. We just say, Lord, here's the problem. And he says, no problem. <laughs> well, why is it not a problem? <laughs> well, because I'm with you. I've already set this thing in place. It's not going to be you. It's going to be me. Because if you'll show up, I can show up. And if you'll give, if you believe what I'm saying, and then just do what I've shown you to do, the glory of the Lord is going to, is going to come through you. And things are going to happen that you can't even make happen. See, in our, in our imagination to stumble at this moment because we're so used to imagining our future according to what we think we can do and what other people have said about us. You start letting the Holy Spirit work with you so that your imagination starts co connecting to who God is and what he can do through you. It changes the game completely. And that's often where our greatest battle is because the orphan heart keeps saying, no, you can't. Your sonship, your daughtership is saying, I was born for this. I was made for this. Okay. So God will come back and just say, well, no problem. Because I'm with you. My hand is on your life. My power is going to overshadow your weakness. You remember anybody in the New Testament saying, I, I would rather glory in my weaknesses than in my strengths. Why? Because when I'm weak, he shows up strong and he gets all the glory and it makes me look good. <laughs> you know, we, ha we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. We've spent our whole lives trying to dress up our earthen vessel for everybody else to look like something. You know, we're patching our patches. We spent a lot of time in that beauty salon. We got a lot of salons in America, by the way, that are all about education and other, other kinds of things. We're, we're constantly trying to dress up the earthen vessel to impress people. So there's a, I'll just go ahead and say there's a whole lot of churches that are trying to dress up to impress people in order to get them to come to Jesus. But one of the biggest moves of the Holy Spirit happened in a place that used to be a, a livery stable. Where all they had was some benches that they managed to clean all the poop off of <laughs> and uh, sweep out the place and not impressive to anybody. The Holy Spirit showed that they're so thick that people could actually lay down on the floor in a cloud of glory and be instantly healed. And fire trucks kept showing up because 
people kept reporting that there's a building on fire. And they could see flames of fire coming off the building and the, the fire department would show up. There's, there's no fire because the fire is inside. The fire of the spirit. And that movement that happened in Azusa Street swept over the entire world, completely changed the face of the church and touched more nations that way than any missionary movement ever produced in previous years. And God chose to do it in a little place that a lot of people wouldn't even be seen in. It was so undignified to them. Because obviously God dwells in crystal palaces with stained glass and gold-plated communion sets. And the pastors wear their robes and collars. We call people reverend. Okay, I, I'm going, I'm, I got to get out of this. <laughs> and I really believe that the future move of God is going to be with people who have moved out of that orphan thinking, churches that have moved out of the orphan thinking, where we're no longer dressing up to impress the world. We only have one person that we're living to impress, and that's our God. And I've come to believe that God is enough to reach the whole world. So he says to Jeremiah, don't be afraid of them. Just because they reject the package. Just because they don't esteem you. They look at you through the world's eyes or through the religious system's eyes or whatever. He said, don't be afraid of them. That's something that you and I have, have to learn how to do with God. Is because if you begin to walk in your true identity with God and you start stepping out, uh, you're, you're going to run face to face with people who don't want to let you be who God says you are. And they're going to try and push back on you and just say, who do you think you are? And you're going to have to make a choice about whether or not you're going to be afraid or stand in the love of the father and say, I have the right to be here. I have authority from heaven to be who God's called me to be. Fear is always a choice. And so Jer God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, don't be afraid to be who I've called you to be and to do what I've called you to do. Don't set your eyes on what any person around you, any response that they have. You stay focused on me. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and he touched my mouth. And you can make a lot of things out of that, but I believe that there's there are encounters that God has set us up for related to our identity and our destiny. There's encounters that he set us up for where as we move with him in agreement to say, okay, Lord, I, I believe who you say that I am. I believe that you call me. I believe I can do what you call me to do. I, I choose to, to happen in the earth in your name. That's when we respond that way, even as Mary responded to Gabriel and said, be it done unto me according to your word. That's when the overshadowing comes. That's when the power of the spirit comes and begins to impart some things to us that we previously didn't um, operate in. There's an, fresh anointings that come that suddenly touch our agreement with God. And suddenly there's a fire that's ignited. There's, there's a possibility that's ignited. And we don't have time this morning. I'll, hopefully I'll get to this next week. Well, we'll, we'll see. Sometime. <laughs> but I would just say both, both Saul and David were anointed by Samuel. And they both had to agree with the calling on their lives to be the king of Israel. Both received the spirit of the Lord. 
and it says the spirit of the Lord came upon them mightily. But there was a big difference between what Saul did in response versus what David did. Anyway, that's, that's another whole study. You should go read it. It's a first Samuel. Go, it's exciting stuff. So he touched my mouth. And I believe there's a great touching, a great outpouring that's coming in the days ahead for people of God who start moving into what God says about them. Behold, I put my words in your mouth. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to say this very clearly again. The things that God has appointed you to and called you to do, you can't do it. Get over it. <laughs> if it's about you, it's going to crash and burn somewhere. You're only going to produce an Ishmael. You'll never produce an Isaac. But if you don't have to get any of the credit or any of the glory and you don't care what other people think, um, God's going to be free to move through you to do what only he can do. It's That's why in Zechariah 4, when they they bogged down in the rebuilding of the temple and so God came along and, and he began to prophesy over Zechariah or over uh, Zerubbabel and, and the other guy. <laughs> and, uh, and God said, I'm going to put my spirit on you. I'm going to begin to do something because what you're going to do to complete the rebuilding of this temple, it's not by might and it's not by power. It's going to be by my spirit. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be putting the capstone on that temple, and you're going to be shouting grace, grace to it. See, I love the fact that what God has called us to do ultimately, it'll, it, it will be to the praise of the glory of his grace. Ephesians 1, to the grace, to the glory of, of his grace over our lives. That in the end, everyone will know, all of heaven will know what happened through our lives here in the earth was not because of us. All of those works, by the way, are all going to burn up. They'll all be tested by fire. Everything that you and I attempted to do for God in our own strength by an orphan heart, you're going to watch it burn up at the judgment. But everything that was done for his glory by his power and his strength, and you didn't need a thing, and you just came in your weakness because you love him and you believed what he said about you, those works that flow through your life that way, they will stand the test of the fire and they will go with you into eternity as reward. That's another whole message. See, I've appointed you this day. We'll wrap up here. I've appointed you this day over the nations and over kingdoms. What, what happens to the person when God reveals to you, I've appointed you over? And he starts talking to you about dominion. He starts talking to you about having authority to, to change and, and, and reshape things. When Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. He never saw that prayer being answered apart from you and I living according to who he was going to make us to be. We are the ones who have been appointed to release heaven on earth and reshape what's happening in the earth. We are we're going around and destroying the works of the devil. We're tearing down the strongholds of the enemy. We're taking captive every thought that's been exalted above the knowledge of God. We're going around and we're healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out demons. And we're, we're giving the, the devil a migraine because we are supposed to be unstoppable. That everywhere we go, uh, you know, it's amazing that the early church 
did not have an army. They didn't have a political party. They had no weapons. And yet within three to 400 years, they had completely undone the entire Roman Empire. And I heard some, uh, I've, I read some uh, historians, not even Christian historians, who said that the reason why the Roman Empire eventually collapsed um, was because of the power of the early church. And the number one thing that the early church did was cast out demons. This historian said the Roman Empire was completely rearranged because they could not contend with the church's ability to overcome evil, casting out demons. He didn't even talk about healing the sick. Woo. By the way, every person in this room, you have an assignment to cast out demons. Well, I've never met one. There is a demon in your future. Should you choose to your, accept your assignment? So I've appointed you over nations and over the kingdoms. Well, Jeremiah's not even, he's, he has no political position. He's not a king. He has, he has no power whatsoever. And that God is telling Jeremiah, I've appointed you over the, these entire power systems of the world. Now, I want you to think really big. Can God so work through your life that the power structures that are that we get intimidated by in the world that you can actually operate with a degree of authority to see those things change. Okay. See, we have a hard time going there because our our the way we look at ourselves right now, yet, you know, we just say, well, that's a joke. How would I ever be put in a position to see something like that happen? Here, let, let me say it this way. The entire world system is nothing but a house of cards. Just like this present uh, government administration, fake administration in America, right? It's nothing but a house of cards. It's barely, it's, it's piled up really high. It's looking, you know, all you got to do is just pull one card out of the bottom. And the whole thing can come down. All it takes is little Toto showing up. And pulling the curtain back and the whole wizard of Oz is exposed to be nothing but a man. You never know how God will use you to touch certain people that will. God may use you to influence somebody else who's going to take down an entire, you know. Maybe God needs some of you moms to believe this about your kids. You say, as parents, one of our greatest assignments is to impart destiny and identity to our children. Tell them who they are and what they're going to do. He said, I have appointed you to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So I ordain you to be God's wrecking ball <laughs> to all the things of darkness. Can God use you to wreak havoc in the systems of the world? And just start plundering the enemy's camp. I've come to realize I, 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 
See, I, I signed up for ministries because I wanted to build something. God said, well, actually, I've appointed you to spend a lot of time tearing things down. Because I can't build what I want to build until the rest of this is removed. And this is true about what's in our own hearts. Boy, there's a lot in us that actually has to get torn down, plucked out, removed before God can then build. See, what he's going to build through you, he has to build inside of you first. And so that means there's a lot in us that has to be torn down. And we cooperate with God coming into our identity and so that what's so fun is what you see God build in you, you now have you now have faith to see him build it in somebody else and build it in an entire area. And it's unstoppable. It just goes on and on. Okay, I'm making myself stop. There's a bake sale calling to hungry stomachs right now. Okay, well we're gonna we're gonna just keep going through this, and uh, we'll see see where God takes us and all this. But um, you may have to go back and listen to this again multiple times because uh, there were there were a lot of nuggets and all that. And uh, but ultimately, what I've shared with you is going to require a lot of faith, requiring a lot of faith from me. And um, whew, I just wish. I had known all this stuff back in my 20s. Yeah, I might not have gone to seminary. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, let's, let's stand. Thank you, Lord. How many of you would say you got an, an upgrade in what you believe about God and his goodness towards you right now? That he's, that he's more for you than you realized. He's more in love with you than you may have realized. He's more excited about you and your future. And of course, now remember, the enemy is going to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, well, look behind you. As soon as you turn around to look behind you, you'll disqualify where you're going. Don't look behind you. His mercies are new every morning. But Lord, we just say that we're here to believe what we've not believed before. We want to fully embrace your words over our lives and over our church and over our nation even. I thank you, Lord, that you know the plans that you have for us. I thank you that you're here by your spirit to breathe over all of the things that have already been planted in us and prepared in us that we're, we're not even aware of yet. But Lord, we just want to give you permission, blow on the on these things, the embers of these things that have are, are already in our lives. Lord, I ask that every yes in us or throughout the years towards you, you just blow on those yeses and just cause them to rise up as a flaming fire, Lord. And Lord, we also just come to you with every painful, hurtful thing that's in our past that seemed to try to destroy us. And we're going to stand here right now and say, thank you, God, that you work everything together for good. And you can take my, the worst things in my life and turn them into a massive weapon against the forces of darkness. And, uh, and Lord, nothing is wasted. What other people meant for evil, Lord, you meant it for good to shape us and prepare us. So, Lord, we just declare your identity spoken over us. We embrace it. We believe it. Show us how to live it by the Spirit of God. 
Uh, Lord, I just pray that you you will release fresh revelation this week. I pray that you just bring dreams and visions and all kinds of things. Uh, as we're reading our Bibles, stuff jumping off the page at us we've never seen before. Just start talking to us. We give you permission. Just start talking to us about us. And Lord, we tell you in advance, we're going to believe it as you say it. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah.